Good evening, Bill. Good evening, Sandy. It's, uh, <laughs> what a lovely evening it is. Is it? It's pitch black and freezing cold here. Uh, the sun should be shining on my face in about 10 minutes. We'll see if that happens. <laughs> I actually have a hot water bottle in my lap. <laughs> you do not. I do. Look. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> I'm so cold. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, it's got nothing to do with what we should be talking about, which is childish. Apparently, Sandy lives in the 1920s. But yes. <laughs> Hmm. Childish. Yes. Are you childish? <laughs> um, I think in some ways, yes, very much. And in other ways, not at all. Hmm. I think people could be childish in different, you know, completely different ways of their life, you know. I mean, we use childish as quite a derogatory term, don't we? Oh, they're so childish. It's, it's, it, it, I think there's a judgmental edge to it, especially if you're referring to an adult as childish. Mm. Actually, and if you're referring to a child as childish, that's even, you know. Well, I mean, sometimes I, I feel it nearly coming out of my mouth at school speaking to a student, you're so childish, don't be so childish, or something. Of course they are, they're 11, yeah. And you think, well, yeah, of course. I mean, even at yeah. 14, childish. Yeah. But, I mean, there's a distinction then between childish and childlike, right? Yes, I would say that I'm more childlike than childish, mm -hmm. as a general rule. <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, I think that implies the, the positive aspects of it, the open-mindedness, the creativity, these are things I strive towards, you know, I refuse to get a real job. I will never be a real boy. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, and some people could see that kind of thing as childish. You know, I could certainly see a judgment there. Are you still, are you still the child you once were? No, I... I didn't like the child I once was. I mean, you don't That's have to shit on here, but you know. No, but the, the, the child that I, the when, yeah, my childhood, I didn't, I didn't particularly like being me. I think if anything, I'm a better version of the thing that I was as a kid, as opposed to, I think there are a lot of people see their child, their, the inner child in them or their, their, youth or the child inside of them as some sort of idealized version of them right you know what i mean or some sort of blank slate or something like that you know before it was corrupted by the world and society and age and experience and all the rest of it mm -hmm. but i kind of go the other way i've built up walls and walls and walls around your child so that could be the the man you see today <laughs> most you know, people i like and get on with well are kind of childlike in some way i think sure and i think the people who judge people for being well see you said childlike mm. do you see the difference between it and childish i think it's because of this a, a kind of negative feeling about childishness sure um but when i think about what it means to be a child and i remember being a child myself um, there are still things I know about myself that are incredibly childish, but that are not necessarily negative. Right. So um, maybe this is about how one kind of views oneself in that I might perceive myself as if from outside. And if I'm doing that and I'm observing myself and I'm also observing myself as a memory, I might say that I'm seeing childish attributes and kind of just simply identifying with them is actually quite co comforting because it's about maybe a root of experience or an experience that I've had and that even if not fondly remembered it might feel that I'm at least connected to so okay. hmm. anyway Slide number one. Yeah, I, 
I think this is a kind of beautiful, beautiful photograph. Um, which is so just as far as we know, is this is this, you know, just documentary? Is this, you know, I mean, I know that's generally what he did, but it feels hmm. so perfect that it almost feels forced. Exactly where the ball is, you know, the way the kid's legs are. No, I think this is this is real documentary photography. This is not planned. It's not set up. Um, I mean, he was in and around the West, West End, the East End of London anyway. You know, he cut his teeth photographing his friends who were all kind of small town crooks and gangsters when he was a teen. All kind of wide boys and um, teddy boys in the, in the 50s. And then I suppose graduated really to, to more kind of what one might think of as detached or serious documentary. Sure. Um, in terms of childhood and thinking about what being a child is, somehow this, <laughs> this encapsulates something, but I've often wondered with this photograph, if I'm more aligned with the child or the cat? You, the cat. <laughs> it, I, I'm being serious. I, no, I'm not. I'm not making it. Uh, I'm being perfectly serious too. No, but um, this is, this photograph is interesting because the you know you have this kid who's alone. I don't think most people, if you were to describe childish, a lone kid doesn't necessarily. I don't think if you don't generally think of kids as singular. You know what I mean? It's well, I mean, this is kind of why I put this in here, really. Um, I mean, this to me is about being alone and also the idea of, of being lonely, really. Absolutely. And lonely as a child. And and at the same time, you know, the walls are filled with a bunch of things that as a kid he wouldn't think about the price of a can of tomato soup. I mean, we could we could over contextualize this we could make lots of assumptions about who this by the way what does it mean the 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 two three is that like two pounds three shillings or something is this still yeah. back when they were using yeah shillings and what how many shillings in a pound no idea okay were you lonely as a child bill yes did you know loneliness though at the time or do you reflect on childhood as a lonely time i was lonely at the time you knew it. Yes. Mm. Even if there were people around. Mm. Still, I'm as an adult in a lot of ways. I think that's why I seek out the things that I do. But but yes, I knew it. I, I look at a picture like this, and obviously I wasn't living, you know, I wasn't hanging out on the street with stray cats where I grew up. But the cat looks most diffident. <laughs> but actually the cat is a pretty cat <laughs> but i i totally know how this kid feels yeah um i it's funny if i look at this i don't and i don't know maybe there are other people who look at this differently like this kid seeing this kid this way makes me sad it doesn't make me uh, you know um what would be the opposite of that when talking about a child? Um, there's no optimism here, you know? Yeah, there's no nostalgia good. here. There's no home, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it, it also feels like, you know, McCullen saw this kid and took the picture, but otherwise this kid was ignored. I mean, what's interesting about Don McCullen's kind of vast archive of work is that I mean as a documentary photographer who's been to you know war who's been out to cover famine in Sudan I mean children are so emotive aren't they they're gonna really get under our skin I wonder if 1962 even in London you know he does understand the currency of using a child in a photograph so even though it's a record and as such, I suppose documentary photography needs to just record quite passively without the photographer really entering into it. I have always doubted whether McCullen hasn't 
actually entered into it. I think I shared with you, Bill, maybe a couple of years ago now, the McCullen Dunhill advert thing yeah. sponsored by Dunhill. And in it, he says something about, um, you know, there's nothing you can do about what's unfolding in, in what you photograph in that, you know, you could be in a war zone in a clearing and a militia man could bring a hostage or a prisoner and could say, I'm going to kill this man. And there's, you know, you can't do anything about that. And he was kind of explaining this in rather an exasperated way. But that that's part of the point of what he does. And though nobody's dying in this photograph, I do wonder if somebody is in some way suffering. Well, it's um, also a, a young black kid in 1962. Yeah. So There's a whole racial angle, right? You know. There is. I mean, life would have been pretty tough in the East End of London in 1962. There was still a lot of regeneration after the war, after the Blitz. You know, people were living still in sometimes slums. Um, and yeah, life would have been very hard. These streets would have seen lots of, uh, I suppose, dark deals, shady goings on. Yeah, this kid probably Lots knew all that stuff was going on. Kids are not dumb. No, not at all. <laughs> what I find unusual about it is actually the street looks clean. Yeah, it is funny that he's sitting there and there's not there's not a whole bunch of trash all over the place or anything like that. And, you know, the cat looks pretty darn clean. and Well, even look at the pants he's wearing. There's the, like the cuffs seem pretty clean and well, you know what I mean? He's got his little white socks on. And his socks. Cute kid. Look at the little shoes. But what do you think this is? Is this is this a photograph really about childhood at all? You know, it's funny that what I said about seeing this kid and and, and feeling the loneliness or whatever mm. could be that he's around people all the time. And this is his one moment of solace to go around into this alleyway and sit by himself. You know, I'm I'm reading into that. Yeah, we are. Well, that's what we do, though. Not just you and I. Anyone, anyone who's anyone who's awake <laughs> is going to start doing that, aren't they? I'm sorry, you, you had a question. I, I forgot what it was. What was the question? I can't remember either. Is this the set that's at MoMA? Some of it's in MoMA. It's split across um, two collections. So MoMA bought half. There's like 60 panels in the migration series. So there's a lot of work in it. Yeah. Mm, but this particular painting... I don't know, it stirs up some stuff for me. Um why this one in particular? I think it I think it's about that that the peering over the edge of the table, the kind of again alignment with memory. And I think this is an unavoidable and interesting thing about looking at children in art is because we have have all been children. It's yeah. the maybe the most kind of powerful motif. More than what mother. Is what is she cutting? I think it's meant to be bread. Yeah. Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, more than mother. Yeah, I think so. Because we've all been children, but by definition. We've all had that experience. Yeah. But we've this all had different experiences, but we've all had that experience. There's also something about Jacob Lawrence. I mean, this his style, this sort of starkness, the negative space, like all that stuff. He's there's not a lot of extraneous stuff in his work, you know. I mean, I'm trying to think about what, like, he's, he called his work a particular thing. Style, um, you mean? Yeah, like, he called it um, dynamic cubism, I think. Okay. Uh, I mean, he was a painter over a very wide span of time. I, I mean, just as a kind of aside about Jacob Lawrence I think we've talked about Lawrence before we certainly will talk about Lawrence again I'm sure uh, but you know he was a, 
a pioneer maybe in some ways who's certainly a very um early example of african americans having been taught by other african american artists to be artists um and lots of his influence came from harlem like the colors and the 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 lives in harlem isn't it interesting too i mean you look at this the woman in this painting and her head's crouched down her shoulders are up and her arms are strong Mm. Like her arms are as big as her head. You know what I mean? It's like this sense that mom is working as much as she is consciously thinking about her state. You know what I'm saying? Well, I mean, this is 4041. Sure. You but know, I, are we supposed to see this from the point of view of the kid or are we supposed to see this as the point of view of a viewer outside? Well, I put it next to the McCullen picture because to me, there's a, a kind of sense of passive observation in this. Mm. Um, but I mean, personally, I identify with with the child and it's that feeling of, of anticipation. Um, and, you know, this is maybe to do also with like hardship, understanding the nature of hardship when one is a child. Um. And if that's that's possible or okay, even for me to say that as somebody who speaks from, you know, a position of enormous privilege relatively. Um, but rem remembering perhaps when times were very tricky, if well, not for financial matters. That but kid's definitely looking at that food. You know. But also I think it's, this one is very much also about a relationship between... He has a child and, and his food. But sure. um, is there, you know, is it about the relationship? I think it's about the relationship between the child and the mother as well. That kind of um, like lazy connection that's in inevitable. And even when not directed somehow, it's just kind of there, isn't it? It's also interesting, like the kids in such hard profile, it's almost like Egyptian looking, you know what I mean? Like the 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 way that he's standing and, and, and the whole look of him there. Yeah. It's kind of fascinating. But are, are you colors that I, as a painter, I would never choose, but they work. You know what I mean? It's like one of those things. What are you going to say? Bill, we're being very bad this evening at talking over each other. We need to get a grip of that because this will be Sorry. Um, difficult to listen to. I don't know which one of us will even pick up on the microphone so are you gonna say something <laughs> can we just look for a minute more at this because i i do want to try and work out child childish mm, your experience of being a child i wonder if we actually can really remember what it's like to be a child like, I think I can remember what it's like to be a child, but that's a thought. And that memory is very powerful, but that memory is also very desiring of certain kind of outcomes through memory. So, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's very easy to sentimentalize the past. And it's very easy to actually mislead oneself a little bit about what's actually been there or has happened. Sure. So, you know, when I see a painting like this and I identify with the child, I, I ask myself, you know, what am I remembering? And if I'm remembering something, am I remembering a truth? Because you can't, can you remember truth? And from, as a, you know, as a child, which also ties in with the question I was asking before, is that is our child still present in us? Because that might give me more hope, actually, of finding some kind of truth in memory of childhood, because I wouldn't have to go very far because I'm still it. I think that we have, yes, we carry the child we once were, but we carry the crystallized picture of where we ended up how we thought about our childhood is the child we carry around. It's the fossil of your childhood, not the actual child. But that implies that it's a dead thing. Yes. But do we not see, 
like I'm trying to uncover this a bit and unveil it to myself. I feel there's something in it. You know, I'm having a memory. So I'm having a memory. So time is passing as I'm having. Yes. Mm -hmm. And what I'm remembering might appear to be a bubble in which something is fixed. But when I reflect, am I remembering essentially a snapshot photograph style memory? Or am I remembering something happening where, you know, thoughts, characters, colors, shapes move as with all life, right? So I'm here now mem remembering and as such, I am traveling through time forward as I go. Yeah. But simultaneously in the past, my past is moving. Forward with you. Yes, but what I mean is that, you know, that movement is, is simultaneous, no? Yes. I mean, I think they're like your memory of the past is moving in parallel with your reality that's changing as we speak. The problem is, you know, it's the old, every time you think about a memory, it changes the memory thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so, how, does, how does this impact what we know of ourselves as children, Bill? I think it's also, you have to remember that, you know, whatever memories you have of childhood are also by definition, your oldest memories. So the ones that have been worked over the most. <laughs> You know, if you're really, really careful, like really careful, and you really, really look at a memory of something, I don't think it works that way, but okay. No, no, but can you? No. What do you mean I don't think it works that way? Why are you being so dismissive? Like, no, I don't think, I don't think that, I don't think memory retention is, is something that you, have intention about mm -hmm. i don't think you can i don't think you can i'm gonna have i'm gonna remember that thing this way or remember the thing i'm going to be very delicate when i remember that memory so i don't oh no but I, I'm, I'm talking i'm talking about something in the in the past in the distant past sure what i'm what i'm trying to get you to think about here is that we have memory and i have a memory from this moment into the past right yeah right but as you say, these these things are well chewed over. These are like my my little my store box of memories that I like to keep close and I like to bring them out and look at them, right? So if I'm remembering something in the past, let's say I'm remembering being a kid in in, in primary school and returning after being very, very ill. So having been away from school for a long time. And I'm remembering the experience of returning to school and being very bold actually <laughs> very bold and in my memory I'm surprised at myself and how bold I was how able I was to just get on with it I'm also remembering the feeling of being taunted by some of the boys in my class because I'd been treated with massive doses of steroids right. and my face was huge it was a big puffy moon face right and I remember it I remember exactly where it was I remember exactly kind of like the, the 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 spatial nature of it everything but if but if we went back and there was a videotape of this happening do you think it would match your memory well possibly not but the other thing i wonder about is can i remember myself having a memory of this at other times when i've remembered it can you think about the now that you remembered it and have that memory? It's like a meta that's memory. What, that's what I mean. So the memory within the memory. And because of that, if I do that and I look at it very carefully, can I actually start to chart where my memories of childhood become just stories? I think they're stories the minute they've happened. Mm -hmm. I think... By definition, your memories are always just stories. I don't know this one. This painting is at Kelvin Grove. It's by Joan Eardley. Do you know, if I was a very rich person, 
I would buy a Joan Eardley painting of children. Why? Because I find them clamoring beasties of energy and well you've also decided to spend your life with children <laughs> yes that's like, see this is something i would never in a million years do as much as i don't you know i like kids give me a baby whatever that's fine like you know to, I'll, I'll play with your kid like it's not that i'm bad with kids just the idea of multiple kids together and all of the interactions and the drama and the, the the society that builds up and the this poor kid covering his face and the mob mentality of it all mm. that you were describing of all the gut boys that were mean to you because of your moon face. Yeah. Um, all of that is something that I don't ever want to experience again if I don't have to. So it's interesting. Why would you want one of these paintings? Well, because I think Eardley does capture like an energy of childhood better than anyone else I've ever seen. Sure, the awkwardness of it all. Well, the the just the brutality, the starkness of what it means to be a child. You're just like you the think... stark brutality of childhood. That's what you want to have put on your wall. Well, why not? You know, it's one thing to sentimentalize things and make them soft and melancholy or poignant or lovely joyous things but there's also then this joyousness in the kind of compelling rawness of childhood listen and i'd put gertica on my wall and that's you know an awful terrible thing but like i feel like that is an inevitable state of life i feel like the terribleness of childhood is a temporary state that we all have to get through in order to get to adulthood a terrible state of childhood did you just say yes yes there were so many things that kind of blighted my childhood truthfully i mean if my mum or dad are watching this i don't mean anything that happened in our family as such but there were lots of things that did my mom go or dad. there are lots of things that did go on that were very challenging and hurtful and I was very ill as a child and I was very lonely mm -hmm. um but I also had such a brilliant time well yeah and so you had a mixed experience you know. Yeah, but that's that's why I had a rich experience. I think that's a good point to make as well. You know, I've I I wonder if it's truth, if it's just in reflection. But I I get the sense that my childhood was rich. I was very lucky to have um such kind of dynamic people, I suppose even if that wasn't always kind to me yeah. in some ways, you know, I think that shapes obviously us, me, sure. I'm grateful for it. But when I look at this and I think, you know, Glasgow kids, a Saturday, a Saturday matinee picture queue. Oh God. You know, would so you want to be in a movie queue in seventh grade right now? Does that sound like fun to you? Well, you know, in some ways, yes. Oh, see. Yeah. See, this is where you and I differ. You'd be like in the swell of it. You'd be listening to people saying horrific things to each other. You'd be there listening in with gossip. And even when we're very small, actually, I remember being in like equivalent of like kindergarten, first grade. Yeah. And, you know, bearing in mind, this was like 1984. Um, you know, very much a kind of segregated girl, boy, playtime you know the boys were outside playing football and the girls are inside playing house and that you know the, the kind of the, in some ways what would become I guess adults miniature adults that we tend to sort of pick over as adults and adults perception of childhood I do remember this is odd I do remember being a child and realizing that the way we were behaving was 
was actually the blueprint for adulthood, not because I think it's a million miles for a child who's relatively smart to say, I'm playing house and this is what I might do when I grow up. It wasn't that. It was more to do with the way we were playing. I realized, I can remember realizing that it revealed something about the fundamental nature of who each of us were. You know, there's bossy children, there's pushy children, there's the synthesis of all the things that children can be, um, and the jostle and the the play and the hysterical laughter and um, boys farting and then boys making fart sounds under their armpits and then people taking their coats off and putting on their heads and pretending to be penguins and you know all the all the things that you desperately do. yeah but aren't they desperately just trying to get noticed well this is where childhood is interesting as a as a map for the future isn't it it's singular it's i it's individual social experimentation if i act like this what does the group around me how do they react I mean, when you look at this, Bill, are you seeing the faces of children you know or knew when you were a child? No. Mm. You do. I so do. <laughs> I so do. And it's not just because Eardley was painting in Glasgow. I mean, just a quick thing about Eardley, because I do hope that if somebody's watching and they haven't heard of Eardley, go and look her up. She had a tragically short life. She died of breast cancer when she was only 42. Um, she painted tirelessly she enrolled in Glasgow School of Art she wasn't from Glasgow originally she's from hmm, where was she from I can't remember somewhere in the north of England maybe but anyway she came to Glasgow she enrolled I think about 1940 in Glasgow School of Art and she started painting and she lived in the town end area of the city which would have been a bit kind of rough around the edges and she invested in painting these children over and over and there's all different iterations of, of childhood captured by Eardley. And that's because actually, probably at that time in Glasgow and probably in that particular place in Glasgow, there was a kind of vibrancy to community. And one might say that the, the movement of community is through its children. And um, the pulse of community is through children. And so Eardley, I think, is expert at capturing capturing that movement that spark and vitality i think what it is that you have a love and respect for other people well, the idea and for the idea of i don't know groups of people as a as a force for good there's like this inevitability that it, it feels like when you're talking you're basically saying <clears throat> you know, with community and the idea of children being the movement in community and all this kind of stuff that it's sort of like, I don't know, that's all there is or something. I don't know. Well, no, I mean, children are beastly, you know, yeah. children are as beastly as their adult selves will later be. Uh, we see this all the time, know that. I, I work in a school, as you say, I choose to work with children every day, albeit older children. Sure. Um, None of it qualifies me to speak of children or to children, but what it does do is I think the fact that I have been a child, which is great because it, there's something so universal in that. All of us can speak to childhood. Yeah. Um, if you think of the best moment, the best memories of childhood to you, is it yeah. you alone or you with other people? <laughs> Well, is this the childhood Sally Mann's daughter had, or is this the childhood that Sally Mann wanted to capture of her daughter? Sometimes, do you know, I don't even care. Right. I think this work is. I think that the 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 controversy, as you would say. Uh, what about this work 
What's that? What do you see? Controversy. Controversy. Yeah. The controversy of, of uh, surrounding this work overshadows this work to the point where I think it gives it, I think a lot of these images that she took in this series are very beautiful, but mm -hmm. I don't think that they are like the best stuff shot in the 1980s, like a lot of people think. It's hard to explain really sometimes what happens when you encounter a photograph that somehow seems to embody everything of memory. And this photograph, like I love immediate family, you know, I love Sally Mann's work. I, like most people have been told to grapple with the morality of the imagery, but really I meet this image and the difference between it and I is nothing. Now, maybe that's because, like, I really do know that I was this child, pretty much. Like, I, I know myself in this. I see myself in this. I mean, I actually do see myself in this. This looks what, like what I look like, you know, yeah, at yeah. this age, right? So everything about it is it's almost like um a collapse of a collapse of time if you can hear what sounds like a rocket launcher it's actually my washing machine i'm really sorry um yeah see i don't identify with this at all But I wonder if you would, if we were looking at Emma in the lake, you know, that very famous image. Yeah. yeah. Are you looking at him and thinking, there I am? No. Have you done that? The, the question is, do you, do, you, do you want to identify with her or does it naturally happen? No, I mean, as soon as I saw this photograph, I just knew that this was something that was about me. I see <laughs> no pictures of kids and think of myself. I, I, but, but Bill, I think the curious thing about it is, is that I'm not, I know I've just said that, you know, I, I, I can identify myself in this, yeah. even physically, right, for the same age, yeah. but it isn't about identifying even a child. It's about identifying something that is maybe about soul or some other thing that you'll think is wishy washy and I don't know akin to like dancing in a fairy circle or something but it it is not it, it's about the something else so it's a photograph of childhood it resonates with me regarding my child I am the child um but it's also about that depth of I don't know something timeless or transcendent of childhood and adulthood or anything else in between and there's just sometimes photographs that that are that way and it's just this one happens to be jesse in the wind from 1989 when sandy robertson was maybe standing at the edge of a loch or the sea somewhere like Ullapool or melanudrigo as a child or Loch Lomond looking back at camera, feeling a bit kind of heart sore about something or thoughtful, kind of ruminating about something, feeling maybe a bit lonely or bored or, you know, maybe I had a, a bucket of a bucket of seashells or collected some moss or something, you know, all the things that I would have done as a child, I see in this photograph. I don't have to see it. I feel it. Do you think that, what, do you find that when, your life in the present is going or not going the way you want it to go, that you tend to, in either one of those, look back at the past more or less. Does that make sense? No, try again. Um, like, I'm not saying this is for me, but in some situation where like, I would be 
depressed. And when I'm more <coughs> depressed, I'm more nostalgic about my childhood or something, something along those lines. Like, do you think that you, that your, your ability to identify with someone else in an image like this is enhanced or not by your mood or your place in your own life at the current time? Of course. Yeah. But I also you consciously know, notice that. Um, well, I mean, I consciously notice a lot of things, Bill, don't I? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. I'm, I'm really kind of searching about here. I don't want to force it out of you if it really isn't a thing for you, but do you identify with your childhood at all? No, or I would rather, I think I grew up very quickly. I think I became the adult that I am at a younger age than I probably should have, at least in my own head. Like my, my own some sense of self was actualized or fully realized earlier than other people, I think. Oh, no, but Bill, maybe that's not... I don't want to overanalyze this to take the beauty sure. out of it, right? But is that not, is that not, maybe instead of seeing this as you realizing adulthood, maybe it's just that you, you found the, the hole through the center of all of it. You know, again, I'm talking about memory now, sure. but, you know, I remember, again, another playground situation. I remember encountering an older girl in the playground who thought I'd done something to hurt some other child my own age, which I absolutely didn't. And I can, you know, even now it makes me feel very sad that anyone should <laughs> think that I'd been mean that way. Which, anyway. But I remember this kind of, you know, feeling in myself. And I know that feeling and it has, the feeling has lasted me, you know, sort of 35 years later. Yeah. Uh, what I'm saying is that just, just, just being the universal, isn't it? Being timeless. Maybe it's not that you realized adulthood. Maybe it's that in childhood, it didn't matter that you were a child or an adult or anything else. It's just that you were somehow aware of, I don't know, that still point inside you. Yeah, perhaps. But that also means just regardless of the way you come at it from an expl explanatory stage, it still means that I either missed or... I never felt carefree as a child. I never felt like a blank slate as a child. I never felt like I, and you know, it's, it's funny because like, I look at this picture and I think she shot this on an eight by 10 camera. I've used an eight by 10 camera. There is absolutely nothing spontaneous about an eight by 10 camera, which means I don't buy this picture as a spontaneous moment. It is a 100% fully constructed composition and and everything else composition yes maybe but i mean also there are several photographs from around this sure. point right so i know that she had her camera was on a tripod i know that she was moving it incrementally she couldn't move it a lot she wasn't hooking it about incredibly short depth of field so that kid was not moving for 30 seconds while she was focusing and putting the film holder in and all the rest of it so <laughs> i look at it and think this is this is an illusion that this is a moment. You know what I mean? And I think that we, I think we want to see, I think we want to see what we think we want to see, right? We want something that's going to, I don't know, uh, confirm the myth we want to tell ourselves, the story that we want to explain the, 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 you know, the, the story in our heads that we think is our childhood reality. Mm, no, see, I, I, 
I do completely understand what you're saying. And uh, I, I know I do this all the time is I'm confirming back to myself in a loop of approval that I actually exist. I know what that's about. Sure. I, I just wonder, this is different because I'm not looking at this child. And although I've told you the story, like I could have stood on a pontoon just like this and all la la la. Again, it's like saying, well, forget that. I meet this. I'm, it's like I'm, I meet it without any thought. <laughs> I don't have any thought. I can tell myself stories about this, and I do. But there's also, like, no story. And where there's no story is that most confronting uh, moment from, from first sight with this photograph that is just about some other thing. And I would say, in a lazy way, it's about childhood. But actually, I would say more, it's about that what I've just said to you, if not the still point of the turning world, but the the timeless element within within the thing that thought calls I. It's thoughtless. See, it's interesting. I look at the little kid in the first picture and I think I want to go over and help that kid. I want to take him out for ice cream so he's not so alone. I want to, you know what I mean? Like I, I want to, I don't identify with the kid. I want to save the kid. But isn't that identifying with the child, Bill? Maybe. Come on, come on but, now. But, it's not a big but, but, but I, but I don't, I'm not nostalgic about it. I want to change it. I, I, I again, I, I don't deserve to be dismissed about this. <laughs> so yeah. really stay with it if you can really go into why you want to do that yeah uh, you don't have to, to tell us here and now you don't have to speak to me about it but to really go into it it's not to analyze it it's not to put yourself on the couch yeah but it is to look and 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 see try and unveil the thing to yourself. There's going to be lots of obvious answers, like why you want to save that child. There's lots of ways you could intellectualize what it is about that child that, child that piques your sentiment, uh, but behind it, in it, past it, what's there for you about your own childhood? You know, what what is it you're saying you don't identify with that child frankly i think that's a nonsense no i do identify with that child but i don't see him as me like i identify what i felt was pain in my own childhood that i i don't look back in any way at childhood and think about it nostalgically or want to relive it or want to watch somebody else experience it by having my own child or live where I used to live and see the place that I used to play as a kid. I have absolutely none of that stuff. I want to run 180 degrees in the other direction for many of those sorts of thoughts. I just, I didn't, I didn't find it fulfilling at the time. I don't want to relive it again. I wanted to have autonomy over myself as soon as possible. And I didn't want to go back, you know, um, so what I, I like, I, I look at pictures like the Sally Mann picture or something. And I think, yeah, like that's, to me, this is just one big illusion. Mm -hmm. This, this sense of, I don't know, carefree identity seeking or something. I don't, you know, I don't well, know. What, I don't like know if it's that, exploration. It's, it's like there, there's. I, I see it as a myth. I think it's a way for us to put a cast on what is ultimately a painful break. But I also just want to, to bring up quickly, just before we finish, that, you know, yeah. we, I, less so you, but I am very quick always to kind of personalize things. But I also want to acknowledge that 
though I might rush to personalize, I am able to see that none of this is personal. Sure, but that's sure. what makes it so amazing that perhaps when I'm identifying with this photograph, that's when I'm telling the stories. But it's when I'm not thinking and when I'm not personal to myself or my ego and I encounter this, there's something else going on. You also have a more visceral response to visual art than I do in general. <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I th honestly think I should just walk about and turn my eyelids half down most of the time. I feel pretty much overwhelmed by virtually everything yeah. I see. There's not a single piece of visual art that's ever made me cry. Well, I mean, I don't Which think, that's, funny the I don't think that's the barometer of good art, by the way. No, but like that, that has affected me at that level. You know, I can think things are beautiful. I can think things are well done. I can find something moving, but it, they never hit me on. And it's funny because I am a visual artist for a living. And I will tell you that nothing I've ever made and nothing anybody else has ever made has ever moved me that way visually. I just don't feel that way about visual art. I do feel that way about music sometimes, unless mm. as I get older. Um, so it's interesting. It's like, I look at almost anything and I go, okay. Or I go, yeah, that's beautiful. But it's not getting past the first floor. And I'm talking about, you know, standing in front of Michelangelo's David, you know, like, it's like, yeah, it's really nice. I can sit here, I can analyze it and I can look at it and I can understand the perfection and I can understand the skill and I can understand the beauty and I can whatever. Bill, do you ever get to a point where you don't understand and it's the beauty of it is there? I mean, there's a visual, visceral, you know, snap judgment of the, of the beauty of something. Sure. But that thing doesn't, it doesn't, it's not visual arts, not emotional to me. Oh, no, actually, this is also, in some ways, as curious as it sounds, it's separate to emotion as well. It's something other than that. You know, my this? emotions are governed by often my thoughts, you know, you know, thinking, feeling, uh, you know, I'm often thinking that I'm feeling something, right? Yeah, I see, it's funny, because I always put those two things as opposites, like thinking and feeling are opposite poles. Mm hmm. Maybe we should look at this together another time. Thinking, feeling. Anyway, Sally Mann. I thank Sally Mann. I know. You love your Sally Mann. Joan Eardley. You know, I thank Joan Eardley. If I win the lottery, I'm going to buy you a painting. <laughs> okay. Jacob Lawrence. I thank Jacob Lawrence and Don McCullen. My goodness, I'd kiss him if I saw him. Is he still yeah. alive? Yeah. <laughs> He's pretty old though now, right? Yeah. I mean, he was born in 1936, maybe. Oh, so he's in his 80s. He's 80 something, yeah. Um wonder where he lives. Maybe he lives around the corner from you and you don't even know it. He doesn't live far, actually. He lives in Somerset. You should give him a call. I have met him. Oh, okay. I met him and I gave him a kiss on the cheek. Whoa! Hey, <laughs> hey, this is a family show. <laughs> he actually, he wrote a lovely inscription for my students. I bought a book for the photography department at school when I met him and he signed it and I told him what it was for. And he wrote... Um, if you let photography touch you as it has touched me, it will take you, it will take you far. Okay. Or something. It, it was that, it was that. And I just thought, you know, off the cuff, there he is. I know he's very well kind of rehearsed at all these kinds of things, you know, yeah. crazy women coming up to him. The it's queue, the queue yeah. waiting to meet him, by the way, was almost exclusively women. Really? <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I met him at Chalk Valley History Festival a few years ago. And I saw him before he did a talk. Um, and I saw him before wandering around in the field. And I looked at him and I know he looked at me because he realized that I, I knew exactly who he was. And I mean, he is a very kind of famous photographer, obviously, and he is a recognizable figure. He's also a very handsome man, very kind of um, austere, tall, very elegant looking man. Uh, and yeah, the talk was populated, I would say, mostly by men. But to meet him and to sign the book uh, was mostly women. Anyway, that's just an aside. Interesting. I would have run off over the hill with him if I'd had a chance. Well, there's still time. That's what I say. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Thank you, Sandy. <laughs>